Chris with City TV and welcome to Inside Santa Barbara, the city's only news magazine show. We bring you up to date on the city's most important issues, projects, and events. Well, it's been close to two decades of planning the airline terminal project at the Santa Barbara Airport, and now the airport is finally taking off on its flight to the future. We have all the details in our top story as well as all the changes you should know about before packing up your bags for your next flight out of SBA. Whether it's planes flying in and out, a terminal teeming with travelers, friends and families sending off loved ones or anxiously awaiting for their arrival, the Santa Barbara airport is always buzzing with activity. But it's more than just business as usual here, as the airport is embarking on a flight of its own, their flight to the future. To better understand the airport's future, it's helpful to take a look at its past. The airport has been owned and operated by the city since 1941. The original Santa Barbara Airport was only a 7,000 square foot building. A year later, at the beginning of World War II, it was quickly transformed from a sleepy local airport to a Marine Corps air station. The Marines constructed 103 buildings and paved about 5.5 million square feet on the field. Fighter and bomber pilots were trained at the Marine Corps Air Station, some by the likes of aviator Charles Lindbergh. Soon after the war ended, the Marines handed the airport, along with some additional land and improvements, back to the city for use as a municipal airport. The last time the terminal was expanded was in 1976. Back then, the airport served 398,000 passengers a year. Since then, passenger traffic has increased more than 115 percent. It is projected that by 2010, that number will reach 890,000. As passenger counts have swelled, space for airline operations and amenities have shrunk. Security equipment required by the Department of Homeland Security after 9-11 has made the situation even more cramped, which leads us back to the need for the terminal expansion. We've really outgrown it, and as much as people love the charm, uh, there are certain deficiencies that just don't make it very uh, comfortable for passengers or efficient for the airlines to uh, run their business. Which is why the airline terminal project is taking off. The first part of the project is already underway, which involves reconstruction of the aircraft parking area. Airline operations will not be affected. No flight delays or cancellations due to construction. Larger aircraft or more aircraft are not part of the plans either. Also taking off is the new 60,000 square foot terminal building, which is expected to open around 2011. The existing historic terminal building will remain in use throughout construction, while the new terminal is constructed directly south of it. It will retain the Spanish colonial revival style architecture of the original terminal. But before you see this new terminal, a few things will first set the stage for its construction. Loop Road in front of the airline terminal will be reconfigured. Taxis and shuttles will have designated space along adjusted Loop Road as well as passenger drop-off and pickup space. The short-term parking lot will be closed and used as the construction staging site. The short-term lot in turn will be relocated to the west end of the long-term parking lot. That means some long-term parking slots will temporarily be lost. But not to worry, there's always long-term parking lot 2 off of Hollister, which conveniently has a free shuttle every 8 to 10 minutes that takes passengers to the terminal. New to parking lot 2 are auto pay machines. Using the auto pay machine here at the parking lot 2 off of Hollister is pretty easy. All you have to do is push the button to retrieve a ticket before entering the lot. Please insert your parking ticket. Please insert your parking ticket. And when you exit, you take that ticket and insert it into the machine just like so. Fee is $2. Please pay the parking fee by credit card, coins, or banknotes. In this case, the machine says I owe $2. I have a $5 bill, but the machine will give me change back. Please push the receipt button to issue a receipt. After I insert the bill, it will print out a receipt and give change. This auto pay machine was installed in Lot 2 in November 2008. 
the tickets themselves were always automated. You just push a button, got a ticket, uh, but when you exited, then you had to pay. Uh, and generally, uh, and we did have individuals here to collect either cash or credit card payments at that time. It's more convenient for travelers or passengers or users of parking. And we had planned to install automated units when we did the uh, terminal uh, construction project. And so we started with lot number two first so that we could get it in and operational and have our passengers and employees become acquainted with it. Back to the airline terminal, the new two-story airline terminal will consolidate services now found in outlying buildings. The Santa Barbara Airport experience for travelers will be enhanced in many ways, like larger boarding gate areas with more seating, centralized passenger screening, food concessions beyond the security checkpoints, improved access for taxis, buses, and shuttles, accommodations for aircraft boarding bridges to improve accessibility, and more restrooms, including restrooms in the passenger hold rooms. The 1942 portion of the existing terminal will be relocated and refurbished to house airport patrol and parking offices in addition to providing exhibit space for historical displays. With all the changes happening at the airport, every effort is being made to preserve the convenience of using SBA during construction. Essentially, we're still going to operate out of the existing terminal while the new terminal is being built. There'll be some small impacts in the sense that, like the roadway when you drive in will be different, and there'll be some temporary walkways and temporary signage. But essentially, once you're in the airport, you'll be going out of the same boarding gates and the aircraft will be parking in the same positions they are now. But traveling itself can be a stressful experience, so if things seem a bit confusing during construction, the friendly faces of airport ambassadors will be there to help you out. The ambassadors will provide a really important source of information during the construction period by representing the airport on a personal level, having information about the facilities, and the services that are available here and also helping provide a person that someone can go to to get information and hopefully make their, their travel experience less stressful and more friendly. The price tag of the airline terminal project is $54 million. No city general fund or local taxpayer money will be used to pay for the project. About $20 million of the total $54 million project will be uh, FAA grant funding, which comes from the ticket tax that passengers pay on their airline ticket. And then the remaining uh, portion will be bond financing, and those will be paid from the airline's rents in the new terminal, as well as our passenger facility charge revenue. And again, that's another charge that's on the uh, airline passenger ticket. The state of the economy has affected the terminal project in a number of ways. Initially, the project was delayed due to an unfavorable bond market. The wait was worth it because the construction bidding environment improved tremendously. City Council awarded two bids, last construction of Santa Barbara for the temporary improvements. Emma Corporation of Santa Monica will be the general contractor for the terminal building itself. The new airline terminal may take some getting used to, which is why the airport is launching a public information campaign, which includes information on their website, public service announcements, and these holding room displays. Loyal passengers love the intimacy of the small airport, but airport officials are ensuring them that they will still get the Santa Barbara experience at the new facility. The building's going to be larger than it is now, but for the amount of activity at this airport, it'll still be one of the smallest terminal buildings in the United States for the level of activity. It'll be very Santa Barbara. I think the design committee did a wonderful job of focusing on maintaining that that Santa Barbara atmosphere and ambiance that this beautiful little airport has, but yet they'll be a little more comfortable once they're in the building. Place to sit, some restrooms, some concessions, the boarding bridge, it looks very Santa Barbara style and it's going to have some wonderful public art in it. So I think we're going to have a lot of pleased citizens.
The cost of parking at the short-term and long-term lots will remain the same, and a World War II memorial will be constructed at the airfield's overlook point to remember all the local aviators who made the ultimate sacrifice during World War II. For more information on the airline terminal project, go to the Santa Barbara Airport's website. That's flysba.com. Well, the city just completed one of the largest solar projects in Santa Barbara. And up next, we take you to Garden and Laguna Streets, where the sun is shining on the city's corporate yard. The energy picture of the United States and of the world is changing whether we like it or not. Photovoltaics is a dream technology because it has no moving parts to require maintenance. It's easy, it's reliable, it's kind of like this cool power out of, that comes out of nowhere. Students love it. Laguna Street project, we're going to be installing 200 to 400 kilowatts of uh, photovoltaic cells uh, on top of the city corporate yard, and that'll be what we call a power purchase agreement. That's installed by a third party company and uh, maintained by them, and uh, we purchase the renewable power produced by that system. The city is really on a track to be more sustainable in every way and if we're reducing our reliance on non-sustainable polluting forms of energy, it benefits everybody. There's some very interesting work being done right here in Santa Barbara uh, using organic material. The goal here is to be able to make low-cost solar cells, exciting new stuff. Solar photovoltaic systems look better and better as the uh, price of electricity goes up. They generate energy when you need it. They generate energy during the peak hours of the day. So that's really a great advantage. It's motivating and optimistic to think that by my actions it can be something that will lead toward a, a greater good. It makes me feel great. It tells me that an investment in solar energy is really going to pay off. And it was simple to uh, accomplish. It takes no maintenance, and uh, I'm doing a good thing. We have to move at warp speed to stop using fossil fuel as quickly as we possibly can. In 1978, the whole world had one megawatt of photovoltaics. That's how much Fresno State put on its campus about six months ago. For us here in Santa Barbara, we get so many days of sunshine. It, you, you can't let the sun just go to waste. Santa Barbara's setting a great example. This is one of the biggest city installations around, and so for them to take this big step, I think can help show other cities how easy it is to go solar. City TV has produced a special documentary called Bright Future Solar Power in Santa Barbara. And you can watch that documentary online on our website, that's citytv18.com. Well, hundreds of Santa Barbara residents give back to the community by volunteering for boards and commissions. And as part of our continuing series on city advisory groups, we take a closer look at the group that advises the city on all things parking. Channel 18's Becky Oxborough has the story. Long ago, city and business leaders realized the value of public parking. Over the years, the city has built 14 public lots and parking structures with spaces for over 3,000 vehicles. To help manage this valuable resource, the city council created a parking district committee. So back in the 1970s, the uh, city established a parking business improvement uh, area, assessment, where they assessed the businesses to help 
fund the construction of some of the surface lots in the downtown uh, Santa Barbara and the committee was established as an advisory uh, committee uh, as part of that. When the assessments were paid off, the council reformulated it to being the downtown parking committee. The downtown parking committee, established in 1988, reviews the parking program's operating and capital maintenance budgets, hours of operation, parking fee policies, and commuting employee policies. It also serves as a community forum to discuss issues and relate them to the city council. Contains so we don't receive general fund money and the monies that we use to do maintenance, to pay staff, to maintain the, the parking structures and their cleanliness all comes from the revenues we generate through both the PBIA, the assessment, and uh, user fees. Since its inception, the committee members have worked to tackle a variety of parking challenges in the city, such as the expansion of Lot 6 at the Granada Garage and the renovation of Lot 13 at the train station. Since building new parking structures is extremely expensive, the committee is continually looking for ways to make the most of existing spaces and maximize ease of use. In addition, Santa Barbara housing prices have drifted out of the reach of many and more and more workers are moving to more affordable locales and commuting. The parking committee addresses the needs of these users as well. We have two commuter lots, one in Castillo at Carrillo and the other one is at Coda and Santa Barbara Street. So those two lots are a discounted um, rate for commuters. We encourage the uh, employees to park in one of those two lots and not park in the other parking lots. One way the Downtown Parking Committee is working to improve city parking is through a six-year parking capital improvement program. As many of these lots are now 30 plus years old. They've gone through earthquake retrofit, but certainly we need to resurface them, re replaster them, replace the revenue uh, equipment. One policy that has long been cherished by both the committee and downtown merchants is the 75-minute free parking policy on downtown streets. And the word we've gotten from a lot of the people in a, who work in a downtown or maybe don't work in town but come to downtown for lunch is they can come in, park the car, go get lunch or run an errand, go shop, you know, get something real quick and be in the car and, and back to their office within the lunch period and not have to pay for parking. However, with the economic recession, consumer spending has decreased and so too have parking revenues. The Parking Committee is now looking at a number of ways to address the repercussions of the economic downturn. Certainly our revenues have taken a hit, uh, as has every, as have everybody's revenues in this last budget cycle. So we're looking at ways to try to, uh, to uh, mitigate operating costs as much as we can, defer some of our capital improvement projects as long as uh, public safety is not involved. For being such a popular tourist and shopping destination, Santa Barbara offers some of the most affordable, accessible, and attractive parking in the world. And with the diligent work of the Downtown Parking Committee, it will remain that way for years to come. For more information on the Downtown Parking Committee, you can go to the city's website, that's santabarbaraca.gov, and click on the Boards and Commissions link. Well, a few months back, we began a series about the new partnership between the library and the Junior League of Santa Barbara. Well, this month, Channel 18's Dominique Blocker takes us to their most recent event that raised both awareness and money for a new children's library. If, as famous Roman philosopher Cicero said, to add a library to a house is to give that house a soul, then could the same be true about a library's role in a community? The Santa Barbara Public Library, along with the Junior League of Santa Barbara, would most likely agree that the public library is like the soul of our community, a place for growth, gathering, and generating passions. The over 300 people who attended this gala last month obviously agree. The library department, along with the Junior League of Santa Barbara, held the event to raise money for a new children's library and highlight the importance of literacy. That universal impact is why, even though the money being raised will support children's literacy and a new children's library, the literacy gala thrown at the Central Library was for adults. I grew up in public libraries. I think that public libraries are a vital part of our community. Um, I think that 
a partnership between the Junior League and the city or the public library system is an outstanding idea because it's the community getting involved in promoting really what is a, an important city function. Although you may not recognize it, this is the Santa Barbara Central Library. But for this event, it's been completely transformed, and the community has come out to show their full support for the Santa Barbara Public Library System and the Junior League of Santa Barbara's new partnership. This is one of their first big events to raise awareness of this project that the Junior League has embarked on. It's just an opportunity to get people into the library and see what a wonderful uh, place that we have here and how we're going to even make it more spectacular. I'm hearing a lot of people say, oh, this is the library, this is the library, and yeah, this is the library. And it's very special for a lot of these people who are uh, donating their time and their money to be here. To, you know, to really see where their money is going, the staff that works here, and all, all the passion and love that we have for what we do. By bringing the public into the library and illustrating that love and passion, the Santa Barbara Public Library System hopes that people recognize the important role libraries play in a community. Youth literacy is of ultimate importance. A well-read community is only going to strengthen our community. Uh, children need as much encouragement that we can give them to read. We need to give them all the tools, and the library helps to provide those tools. We know that, again, literacy translates into opportunity and jobs and growth for people. That growth would only be possible with the support of the Junior League of Santa Barbara, which gathered over 100 vendors to donate to the live and silent auctions at the event. The library and the Junior League have established this amazing partnership and we're going to renovate the children's room. We're going to take the children's room from this main level and we're going to move it down to the lower level. We're going to create this amazing new space, this amazing new destination for the children of Santa Barbara. So we're very excited about this new uh, area that we're going to create with the Junior League. And so are others in our community. I grew up in Santa Barbara, so I've seen this library specifically change over the years. And I'm excited because I saw what the uh, Junior League did down at the East Side Library, and they created a fairyland. I and mean, you walk into this area, and it's just beautiful and magical, and so I'm excited to see what they're going to do here. When the project is complete, the Junior League and the library hope to have a space that children will look forward to using, and that parents will turn to as an invaluable resource. When we introduce the library to these children, they want to come back and use the library system. So that's why it's so important to have a nice space so they can come to. I think more and more people are realizing the benefits of being able to support the library and bring their kids in because there are more resources avail readily available. It gives kids access to computers who may not have them. And so there's a lot of families who um, that's not an issue at home, but we have so many families in Santa Barbara that don't have easy access to computers, don't have easy access to books. Yet even for those who do have those resources, the impact of a library, particularly on children, reaches far beyond the bookshelves. I think it's something that everybody can wrap their arms around so easily because whether you have children or don't, literacy is something that affects everybody. As an old English proverb says, a good book is the best of friends. Once the new children's library is complete, their hope is that many more children will have the opportunity to make some of the best friends, both in person and on pages. For more information on the partnership, go to our website, that's citytv18.com. Well, as we become more plugged into society, increased electronic waste has become an environmental concern. And if you've ever wondered what to do with all your e-waste, stay tuned. Van 2 has your answer. Every day we use electronics and nothing short of a power outage or a dead battery can seem to separate us. But lurking in those electronics are highly toxic substances like lead and mercury. And when electronic waste or e-waste is thrown into the trash, those toxins can make their way into groundwater and the food chain. The Tahegas landfill right now is slated for uh, closure to run out of capacity in about 2022. You know, the majority of that is municipal saw waste. It's the, it's the regular waste stream that's coming out of our homes and our businesses. And e-waste is actually a very small fraction of that. It's probably less than 1%. But this is extremely important because of the toxicity of the materials that are being diverted. But properly disposing of e-waste can be easy. Free e-waste collection events like this one held in March are now regular occurrences in Santa Barbara. 
Uh, behind me we've got a line of four cars. This has pretty much been the situation all morning since 9 o'clock. Um, I think the gentleman from ASL Recycling has counted uh, 250 cars. We're averaging about 100 an hour. This is going to be a tremendous uh, event. At the end of the event, over a thousand cars dropped off more than a hundred thousand pounds of e-waste, including television sets, computer monitors, microwaves, and much more. The Environmental Services Division teamed up with ASL Recycling, a certified recycling facility located in Carson, California. Every month, ASL collects about 600 tons of e-ways from across the state. They say nearly 100 percent of that will be recycled. Down to the screw is actually being recycled, and also even down to the cardboard, the straight drop, you'll see bales of everything that we generate here, so nothing gets thrown away. The e-waste program really is uh, designed to complement the city's larger effort to divert as much as we possibly can from the landfill. The community is really, really dialing into the fact that electronic waste is uh, hazardous or it's, it has toxic material in it and it does not belong in the trash. So people know that it doesn't go in their, in their trash or their recycling bins. For more information on future e-waste events and local recycling centers, go to our website, citytv18.com. Well, a park building on the east side gets a makeover. City TV's photojournalist Jeff Goodwin spoke to some creative youth and the directors of the Santa Barbara Arts Alliance. <laughs> What uh, is going on here is that we have the Santa Barbara Arts Alliance uh, participating in one of their community projects. In this partic particular case, it's a, uh, a mural at the restrooms uh, here behind us uh, at the Eastside Park. This particular location has been an area that's been uh, tagged uh, with graffiti, uh, so graffiti vandalism has occurred here on many occasions. So one of the projects that, uh, that we try to uh, do through the Arts Alliance is uh, to have uh, the youth uh, do graffiti abatement, uh, graffiti uh, removal, graffiti uh, uh, repair. And in this case, we found that the best way to get rid of the graffiti problem is to uh, put up some murals designed by the youth in the community. And hopefully these will uh, deter uh, graffiti uh, vandalism. We start designing. We sign a kids and then we put hands on on, on the on the on the walls. And does the design come chiefly from the kids themselves? Do they create the images that they want to put on the wall? Yeah. Especially the last three murals came from them. But the first you know they need a little push. So we come out with a little nice design first and then they come like natural. They came like putting colors and change the design. So you can tell it's already them. Yeah, well, later on, like later on in my life, and just say I did that, it just makes you feel good you did something. Me gusta pintar, no sé, estar aquí, pasar un tiempo libre en el aire. Um, me siento bien um, porque estamos ayudando a la comunidad a mejorarse. We hereby dedicate Los Sembradores to all those who plant the seeds of life in our community. Que ellas están orgullosas de saber que algo hicieron por la comunidad. Hope you like come for college. Like it can may help me get more community service. So it can help me like way faster and get in. Well, for me, I'll feel proud of ourselves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we did a good job. We worked hard. The same art project was implemented at Bonet Park on the west side. Well, that does it for this month's episode of Inside Santa Barbara. If you have any questions or comments about our show, give us a call at City TV at 564-5311. You can also watch the show online at CityTV18.com. I'm your host, Rachel Senes, and remember to get involved inside Santa Barbara.